No nation, no army is entitled to target women and children. And for that, we strongly condemned the action of the British government and the British army here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of the Energy of Empire series. To begin with a recap, over the last 10 episodes, we've looked at the United States overseas imperial expansion that took place after the subduing of the Native Americans. We looked at the period between 1893 and 1912 and the centrality of figures such as Theodore Roosevelt. I propose that empire arises from a multitude of factors, principally when an imperialist political ideology meets with corporate interests. I want to move on and talk about the presidency of Woodrow Wilson and America's entry into the First World War. But before I do that, I think it's necessary to talk about the origins of the war itself. Additionally, at this time, Britain and not the United States was the world's dominant imperial power. So unlike previous times empires have diminished, here you have a handing of a baton between allies. I'll give a very quick overview of the British Empire, leading to the point in 1914 when it encompassed a quarter of the globe. The British Empire could be said to have its origins, ironically, in a loss of territory. For most of the first half of the last millennium, the English crown had maintained territorial claims in France. The result of these was fighting continuous wars which drained the country's resources. When the last of these territories, the port at Calais, was lost in 1588, England was freed from this cycle. This was also the time when Henry VIII removed England from the control of the papacy, and just before King James VI of Scotland inherited the English crown, de facto unifying the two countries and ending centuries-long military antagonism. In 1707, the Act of Union would fully join England and Scotland into one country, in 1688, the Glorious Revolution saw William of Orange ascend to the throne on the condition of signing a Bill of Rights that placed Parliament in a more powerful position than the monarch. This allowed the British state to collect taxation far more effectively than a monarch such as the French king, who was beholden to the support of his nobility. At this time, Spain was the dominant imperial power in the world, with Portugal holding Brazil. Britain's only substantial territories were in North America. Both those major world powers were declining, however, and the period between 1701 and 1815 could be described as another hundred years war between Britain and France to decide which one of them would be the next dominant global power. Britain, of course, lost its American colonies in 1783. However, as they maintained the United States as a trading partner, it may really have been a gain to the British economy. British imperial ideology at that time was for a commercial trading empire. They did not necessarily welcome the expense of governing foreign territory. Britain maintained colonies at places of geostrategic significance, such as Gibraltar, the Caribbean, South Africa and Singapore, and later on the Suez Canal. After the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, Britain sought to maintain a balance of power on the European continent when no country could become dominant. The British Empire expanded throughout the century until coming to cover one quarter of the globe. Britain held a small military force as compared to other European nations, rather relying on its overwhelming naval supremacy. I'll jump into a closer examination with the Second Boer War, as I think it's an important precursor to Britain's entry into World War I. So just a bit of history on South Africa, the Portuguese mariner Bartholomew Diaz was the first European to explore the coastline of South Africa in 1488, just four years before Columbus reached the Americas. Like Columbus, Diaz was also attempting to discover trade routes to the Far East. In 1652, the Dutch East India Company established a staging post at the Cape of Good Hope. Whilst they initially traded with the local people, perhaps inevitably conflict broke out, leading to the native population being expelled from the peninsula 25 years later. Whilst this was of course the era when millions of people would be enslaved and taken out of Africa, 
the Dutch were actually enslaving and importing people from Indonesia. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British, acting with permission of the Dutch government, seized the Cape to prevent it from falling into the hands of the French. They would ultimately pay the Dutch £6 million for the colony. This led to conflict with the Boer colonists, as the British government outlawed the use of the Dutch language. Many of the Boer then trekked out of British territory. This emigration expanded after the outlawing of slavery. The Boers felt they had a God-given right to keep slaves, but also that the British government wasn't fairly compensating them and their farms would be untenable. Morality aside, they had something of a point here, in that the farmers were required to travel to Britain in order to collect their compensation, and the cost of hiring an agent to do so was equivalent to the cost of one slave. So you can see how the scheme advantaged large landowners with many slaves. In the 1850s, Britain acknowledged the existence of two Boer republics, the Transvaal Republic and the Orange Free State. British interests in the area were conflicting, sometimes with a desire just to hold a staging post on the Cape of Good Hope, and at others to expand inland as part of the wider European scramble for Africa. Conflict with the Boers became a practical certainty after the discovery of diamonds and gold from the late 1860s onwards. In 1877, the British annexed the Transvaal Boer Republic due to it being bankrupt and under threat from the Zulu. Zulu-initiated wars had killed over a million Africans at that time. After the defeat of the Zulus, Boer resentment turned into full-blown rebellion and the first Anglo-Boer War broke out in 1880. The conflict ended almost as soon as it began, with a decisive Boer victory where they regained their independence. This is where the figure of Cecil Rhodes enters the story. Rhodes had emigrated to South Africa in 1870, aged just 17. After failing as a cotton farmer, he tried his hand at diamond mining. I have heard a story that he made his initial fortune by constructing a refrigeration unit and selling ice cream to miners working in the blazing heat. I can't confirm it's true, but it's certainly too good a tale to leave out. What is certainly true is that Rhodes received financial backing from the Rothschild banking family, enabling him to buy out many small mining companies and eventually found one of the world's biggest diamond suppliers, De Beers Consolidated Mines. Rhodes entered politics in the 1880s and became Prime Minister of the Cape Colony by 1890. He instigated various race-based policies aimed at creating a slavery in all but name for the black population and ensuring cheap labour for the mines. Rhodes then settled people on Matabela land, which led to skirmishes with the Matabela people, resulting in them being driven from the land and the country of Rhodesia being established. This was also the first war to see the deployment of a true machine gun, the Maxim, which cut down thousands of Matabela soldiers. In 1895, Rhodes supported the Jameson Raid, an unsuccessful attempt by mercenaries to effect an uprising of British citizens in the Transvaal Republic. The British, who were there developing the mines, were disgruntled at having to pay taxes, but being denied the right to vote until they had been resident for 14 years. The Boers wanted to maintain the Transvaal as a Boer Republic, and additionally, President Paul Kruger didn't want to be voted out. You can hear how the British portrayed this in the 1936 film, Roads of Africa. Johannesburg, as it now is, was built by us. Yet you pass iniquitous laws denying us the ordinary rights of citizenship. Mr. President, we are here now seeking redress by constitutional methods. But if you persist in your attitude of blank refusal, you try us beyond endurance. Johannes Paul Kruger is my name. Johannesburg is my own town. And I feel towards it like a father whose daughter has been debauched by ropes and thieves. The interview is at an end. The raid was a disaster. President Kruger knew that it was coming and had his forces arrest the privateers. 
Additionally, whilst the foreign citizens in Transvaal, known as Uterlanders, would have liked voting rights, they were not sufficiently disgruntled to actively rebel. In the ensuing scandal, Rhodes was forced to resign. Sir Alfred Milner was then appointed High Commissioner for South Africa. Milner was a friend of Rhodes and shared his imperial ambitions. He worked to sell the coming war on humanitarian grounds, presenting the Uterlanders as British citizens who were being mistreated by the Boer. In their book, Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War, Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor proposed that Transvaal State Attorney Jan Smuts acted as a double agent for the British. I certainly can't confirm this, but they make an interesting case. Smuts had been a supporter of Cecil Rhodes and a unified South Africa up until the Jameson Raid. After the raid, he became Rhodes' fiercest critic. As state attorney, he instigated policies which inflamed relations with the Uterlanders, opposing Paul Kruger's more conciliatory measures. Smuts even employed the language of the Targaryens, saying South Africa must be baptised in blood and fire. Smuts was also in charge of the Transvaal's delegation to an 1898 peace conference at Blomfontein. With both he and his opposite number, Alfred Milner, desiring war, the outcome was inevitable. There had been a considerable military build-up in British South Africa. Paul Kruger insisted that troops be withdrawn from the borders. Apparently they weren't actually on the borders, so I'm not sure if Kruger was just looking for a reason to strike first here. War was declared on the 11th of October 1899, and began with a Boer offensive into the British-held Natal and Cape Colony areas. The Allied Orange Free State also entered the war. The Boer proceeded to lay siege to the towns of Ladysmith, Mafeking and Kimberley. Initially the war was a disaster for the British forces. They believed that a bunch of farmers would obviously be no match for the might of the Empire, and it would all be over by Christmas. The Boer, however, were excellent marksmen and horse riders who knew the territory they were fighting on. The British Empire was not a land power. Officers had no sense of tactics and considered camouflage to be unsporting. The Boer were, therefore, repeatedly able to defeat the British in battle. In spite of this, ultimately the British were able to pour in unlimited numbers of men from around the Empire, lift the sieges and capture Johannesburg and Pretoria. Field Marshal Frederick Roberts then offered an amnesty to Boer soldiers who took an oath of neutrality and returned to their farms. Many thousands did so. However, those that refused now engaged in a guerrilla war. The British army controlled the cities, but not the land beyond it. The Boer conducted raids against railways and resource and supply targets, all aimed at disrupting the army's capacity. In one ten-day period alone, the Boers were able to inflict 1,500 casualties. Boer commandos such as Christian de Wet became internationally famous. Schoolboys in England collected cigarette cards of the Boer commandants. They prized one above all others. De Wet, to my mind, was a, a fly-by-night type of figure, and for that reason, young as I was, I admired him, although he was an enemy. And, as I say, he flitted from place to place, uh, causing damage to our troops in a way before we could retaliate. The British response is one of the most controversial parts of its imperial history. The British and American press had decried the approach of concentration camps employed by the Spanish against Cuban rebels. As we saw in episode 5, the Americans used this as a justification to go to war and then employed the same brutal tactics in the Philippines. Britain would now engage in warfare against the civilian population, burning thousands of farmhouses, destroying crops, slaughtering animals, and in several cases, raping Boer women. Both Boer and Black women and children were removed from their burnt-out homes and placed in concentration camps. Conditions were so squalid up to 50,000 of them perished. I'll play a clip from the documentary film, The Boer War, which contains the voices of witnesses to this period and describes the actions of peace activist Emily Hobhouse in exposing what the camps were really like. The more camps Emily visited, the more aware she became of the scale of the dying. 
I began to compare a parish I had known at home of 2,000 people, where a funeral was an event. Here, some 20 to 25 were carried away daily. The full realization of the position dawned upon me. It was a death rate such as had never been known except in the times of the great plagues. The whole talk was of death. Who died yesterday? Who lay dying today? Who would be dead tomorrow? Another child had died in the night. And I found all three little corpses being photographed for the absent fathers to see someday. Emily was devastated by the death rates amongst the, especially amongst the children. She loved children. She felt they were completely innocent. The women might support their husbands, but the children were really the, the brunt of the wars on them. Emily saw for herself how families suffered even before reaching the camps. On Springfontein railway station, she found 600 people huddled under trucks and makeshift canopies. To such a shelter, I was called to see a sick baby. The mother sat on her little trunk with the child across her knee. She had nothing to give it, and the child was sinking fast. I thought a few drops of brandy might save it, but though I had money, there was none to be had. I thought of the superintendent of the camp a mile off and sent a hasty message to ask him to let me have some for a sick child, but the reply was that his supplies were only for his camp. There was nothing to be done, and we watched the child draw its last breath in reverent silence. The mother neither moved nor wept. It was her only child. Dry-eyed but deathly white, she sat there motionless, looking not at the child, but far, far away into the depths of grief beyond all tears. Another parallel with the American occupation of the Philippines is societal hostility to reports of atrocities. This next clip describes the treatment Emily Hophouse received back in Britain. She returned to England and wrote a report describing the camps, urging reform, if not abolition, of the whole system. But her views were not welcome. Many people thought that Emily was a traitor, so they were very rude to Emily, a lot of people in the drawing rooms of London. They, if she was introduced, they'd turn their back. And, um, they just weren't prepared to listen. But the Liberal opposition leader listened. Drawing on Emily's information, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman publicly denounced the methods of barbarism being used against the Boers. The Daily News gave a full page to Emily's report on the camps, including her description of the misery she witnessed at Springfontein. A vociferous minority in Britain opposed the Boer War, some on moral, others on political grounds. Emily's revelations came as a godsend. But anti-war speakers like the young Liberal MP David Lloyd George had great difficulty getting their views across, as a silent feature film showed. The crowd branded him a traitor and rioted. The Tory establishment also went on the attack, exemplified by a contributor to the Times. The Boer women have proved themselves to be very dangerous enemies. We may admire their courage, but they have forfeited the right to be considered non-belligerents. But British High Commissioner in South Africa, Lord Milner, had no illusions in private about where the responsibility lay. While a hundred explanations may be offered and a hundred excuses made, they do not really add up to an adequate defence. The children will all be dead by the spring of 1903. Only I shall not be there to see, 
as the continuance of the present state of affairs will undoubtedly blow us all out of the water. The debate as to whether British actions constitute a genocide or not goes on to this day. I'll play a clip from the documentary Scorched Earth, the Anglo-Boer War, to illustrate this. Was there a Boer Holocaust? It was genocide. Very, very clear genocide. It started off as a war against the Boers, the republics, and then for military reasons they started with the concentration camps, but that then spilled over. And then they used the Cuban methods. Then, in, in fact, they, the war turned into genocide. It was planned. Nobody can say they didn't know, especially the commanders. How could they not know? Concentration means disease. You don't need a policy, you just need to neglect. 41 camps, right out of the country. There was a central command that got all the statistics and saw this happening. This is a nation dying. I'm quite sure that there was no intention on the part of the British military that women and children should die like flies in camps. There is no evidence of a deliberate policy to exterminate. And it's therefore uh, wildly, grotesquely uh, incorrect and unjust to accuse the British of a genocide or an attempted genocide of the Afrikaner population. It's very easy to take the word concentration camp and think of it in terms of the Nazis. When Goebbels pointed out that the British had set up concentration camps, uh, he was really mistaking concentration camps in the British sense in South Africa with the extermination camps that the Nazis um, had uh, set up and which, uh, which he himself was involved with. And this was a classic propaganda technique. Obviously, from the point of view of the victim, uh, any difference may be semantic. I mean, if you die, you die. And if you uh, almost starve, you almost starve. Doesn't matter what the, the policy behind it is. Now, whether you're going to do it by shooting him through the head immediately or by slowly starving him to the death, I mean, it's the same principle. For the Boer people, the number of women and children and old people who died in the concentration camps percentage-wise, was a Holocaust. I've always been struck that in the United Kingdom, Remembrance Day is to remember soldiers from the First World War onwards. I can understand not including the Crimean or Napoleonic Wars. I can certainly understand not going back to the Hundred Years' War. But the Boer War, many of its veterans lived well into the second half of the 20th century. Perhaps it seemed too embarrassing for Britain to really remember this. Modern British military mythology is based on valiantly defending Europe from the evil Hun, not burning down people's homes and murdering women and children in concentration camps. From a military perspective, there's no doubt the camps were successful, as they convinced the Boer to stop fighting before all their women and children were exterminated. At a cost of, in today's money, over £200 billion, the war was won. South Africa became a united country in 1910 and fully independent from Britain in 1931. This led to the infamous apartheid era, ending with the election of Nelson Mandela in 1994. South Africans certainly have a good case that the troubles their country has seen over the century have been exasperated by the traumas of the war. The ultimate British withdrawal did not signal a failure of the empire, however, what was left behind was a globalist empire of financial control over South Africa's resources. This lived on even beyond apartheid. This is comparable to how we saw US control of the Philippines continuing after the overtly colonial period ended. I'll play some clips from John Pilger's 1998 documentary, South Africa, Apartheid Didn't Die, to illustrate the nature of this. This is Robben Island off Cape Town, where Nelson Mandela and thousands of political prisoners were banished. It seems the right place to ask why those freedoms, for which so many fought and died, are still missing in South Africa. Yes, apartheid based on race is outlawed now, but the system always went far deeper than that. The cruelty and injustice were underwritten by an economic apartheid, which regarded people as no more than cheap, expendable labour. It was backed by great business corporations, 
in South Africa, Britain, the rest of Europe and the United States. And it was this apartheid based on money and profit that allowed a small minority to control most of the land, most of the industrial wealth and most of the economic power. Today the same system is called, without a trace of irony, the free market. In 1976 in Soweto, hundreds of schoolchildren confronted white police who opened fire on them. It was the children's action and courage that led to international sanctions. By the 1980s, a general uprising had begun. The apartheid regime began to panic. White privilege that amounted to one of the highest standards of living on earth was clearly at risk. F.W. de Klerk, a so-called moderate, became president and in 1990 made this historic announcement. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. De Klerk's strategy was to seize the initiative and co-opt the ANC leadership. The white establishment and its backers in Washington and London wanted above all to maintain power over the economy and to keep South Africa safe for international capital regardless of the color of its government. Behind these very public meetings, the ANC met secretly with the regime. A special relationship developed in which accommodating the demands of the old apartheid order began to take precedence over the spirit of the Freedom Charter. Nelson Mandela had promised his people that an ANC government would take over apartheid's great collaborators, the mining companies and the financial institutions. He said, it is inconceivable that we will ever change this fundamental policy. But this promise was already broken as the ANC agreed to what it called historic compromises. Before the electronic revolution, this was the trading floor of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. What has not changed is the fact that just five huge companies control almost three quarters of all listed shares here. Known as the Royal Balcony, they represent one of the greatest concentrations of corporate wealth and power on earth. A power that underwrote apartheid in a manner reminiscent of the great German companies that ran the economy of the Third Reich. They're dominated by the Anglo-American Corporation, whose interests reach into every corner of South African life, from minerals to tourism, property to retailing. What's good for Anglo-American, it's often said here, is good for South Africa. In 1960, the South African police murdered 69 peaceful demonstrators at the town of Sharpville. This atrocity was a clear sign to Western business that the population was being disciplined and opposition crushed. Foreign capital poured in, most of it from Britain. Indeed, Britain was the biggest single investor in South Africa, followed by the Americans, who saw their capital return higher profits than anywhere else in the world. The unbreakable promise of the ANC's 1994 election campaign was the reconstruction and development program known as RDP. It was this that would bring to the people of South Africa the basics of a decent life so long denied them by apartheid, water, housing, electricity, education, health care and land. In the words of the Freedom Charter, it would be the restoration of dignity. Two years after the election, the RDP office was closed down as the ANC adopted a conservative economic program known unofficially as cautious Thatcherism. Today, almost a quarter of the national budget pays the interest on a huge debt left by the apartheid regime. This means that the people must pay for their oppression twice over. Thank you for listening. In this episode, I've drawn on the book 
Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War by Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. I've also drawn on the documentary films The Boer War, Scorched Earth, and John Pilger's Apartheid Never Ended. For a critical take on the British Empire, I'd recommend the book Legacy of Violence by Caroline Elkins. And for a brief but insightful overview, I'd recommend the YouTube channel Old Britannia. Next time, we'll take a closer look at the figure of Cecil Rhodes, the secret society he set up to advance the British Empire and its purported role in 20th century history.